Yo. Good evening. Welcome to Line to Gain. Corey James here. Coming to you live from beautiful White Lake, Michigan. Hello, Sanchez. Cat saying hello already. And tonight's episode, we're rocking the gold tops for Grandpa Bob. Miller, Miller Lights tonight. <sighs> Cheers, everybody. We got a good show for you tonight. Um, should be a lot of fun. I hope uh, hope you guys are ready. We're going to be going through all 32 NFL head coaches. Um, my plan is to attempt to rank them from worst to first. Um, what I want out of you guys, hopefully in the chat, I would like for you to just start dropping your top five, your top ten, whatever you're comfortable with, whatever you you know, or maybe where you think your head coach kind of ranks, um, so we can get some dialogue going there. I I uh, I can't sit here and, and honestly tell you that I know every coach in the NFL, and I know you know everything about them. But I, I gave it, I gave it my best shot. It was a, a recommendation uh, out of uh, one of our our top viewers, John Thrasher. Gave me the recommendation to do um, the uh, the head coaches next, uh, based on uh, an article that I think he saw from um, I forget where who came out maybe it was CBS Sports I forget who actually released the article uh, where they had ranked Dan Campbell as like the second worst head coach in the NFL. Uh, a lot of rookie head coaches this year. Uh, a lot of rookie head coaches every year, really. Uh, what's up, John? How you doing, brother? Uh, we're like 19 days, 18 days away from hanging out. I'm looking forward to seeing you at the wedding, man. Uh, you and Brenda, I'm looking forward to you guys getting out here. Coming on up all the way from Toledo. Nonetheless, making the drive, I'm looking forward to hanging out and you know having a good time at the wedding. So, appreciate you as always, John. Uh, Bobby, appreciate you sharing the video. Um, I didn't see any dubs today on Warzone, but I saw you run and just wipe out three homies real quick, super smooth. Uh, if you guys aren't following Solace BLG, go ahead and do it. Uh, we we post their videos from time to time. Uh, Bobby gets on and and, uh, and runs Warzone with some buddies, so um, be sure to check that out as well. It's uh, there's some pretty some pretty smooth KOs on there. Um, anyway, uh, kind of going on that. On that same vein, um, you know, this is a football podcast, and and I focus on football exclusively because that is what I know the best. That being said, how about them fucking Cincinnati Reds? Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that uh, they're perfect, um, that they they have everything figured out. They definitely don't in terms of bullpen and closing, you know, relief pitching in general. But damn, are they fun to watch right now? Are they fun to watch or what, man? Um, just took three out of four from the first place Brewers, uh, who had been on a tear as of late. Um, the Brewers, I mean, the NL, NL Central is probably one of the toughest divisions right now, other than the NL West, uh, just based on um, the fact that the Brewers just have been on a, a solid run as of late. Uh, till the old Red Legs came into town. Uh, pretty interesting, um, pretty interesting series. Very competitive series. Felt like playoff baseball a little bit watching that. Um, so that was that was a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of hitting from pitchers. Wade Miley getting the knock. Luis Castillo today had a knock. Um, a really weird situation with Kristen Ye- Christian Yelich coming up and. He basically laid down a bunt to get on to first, and he run. He's he's gonna get a base a, a bunt base hit and goes past the bag. And the rule in baseball is if you make a motion towards second base, you don't get the grace of like where you can run through the bag on first base and you're safe. You don't have to stay on the bag. If you make a move towards second, you are no longer granted that. Um, uh, immunity, we'll call it, from being tagged out. Well, the umpire at, for the first base umpire said that Yelich 
gestured or made a, a, a jab step, which kind of, yeah, kind of. Uh, Bobby and Todd, I know you're watching. I appreciate you guys coming in. I got some comments to read here in a second. I, I'm really curious if you guys talk about this on Rally Tail Sports this week. Um, I'm really curious your take on it. As a Reds fan, I'm like, sweet. Good heads up play by Jonathan India to tag him and, and get him out. Sidebar, Jonathan India. What the fuck? <laughs> How awesome has he been this year? Uh, defensively with the stick. Uh, he's been he's been amazing, man. So as a Gator fan and as a Reds fan, you know they say a door closes and a window opens or something like that. Uh, Carlos Dunlap leaving the Bengals, Gator, Cincinnati pro team. Uh, the window opening would be Jonathan India. So I've been hounding him on Twitter trying to find a Jonathan India jersey. I'm I'm itching for one. A couple of comments. Uh, John, curious where you rank Urban Meyer. And yeah, a, a lot of rookie coaches uh, in this year's NFL. Um, that is kind of typical, though. You get about five, five rookie coaches or first-time coaches or at least new coaches every season. Um, so it, it will be interesting to see where I put Urban Meyer. As a Gator fan, uh, as a Bowling Green alumnus, um, as someone that despises Ohio State football, uh, um, it's, uh, you know, an interesting relationship that I have with Urban Meyer. Uh, I am interested to see what he can do at the pro level. Uh, I think he's probably one of the best coaches, college football coaches of all time. Um, Nick Saban takes number one from you, but Urban's got to be up there, uh, for what he's been able to do at literally every program that he's been at. Um, Bowling Green, solid football team, Utah, undefeated football season. Obviously, two national championships with the Florida Gators. National championship with the Ohio State Buckeyes. Um, nothing but success in pretty much every facet of the game that he's that he's had his hands on. So, really looking forward to uh, to seeing what he can do in Jacksonville. But, yeah, we'll get to that, his ranking here in a little bit. Uh, comment from Todd, back to the Reds. It's very exciting. Just need to see that momentum after the All-Star game. They beat Josh Hader. I think his best closer in the game. I think that's a fair point. Uh, he's a Reds killer, right? Um, consistently shuts the door. And they had talked about it a little bit on today's TV broadcast that, you know, as David Bell, as the manager, you want Castillo to go seven, maybe even eight into the game. Um, whereas, you know, um, shoot, who's the manager of the, the Brewers? Um it's, um, is it council? No, shoot, I can't even remember. Anyway, former player. Anyway, <laughs> once you drop the name, chat, once you throw the name out there, I'm going to be like, yeah, that's it. Um, you're just saying he's a lot, you know, he's got an all-star level. <laughs> he's got a division winning, you know, World Series contending level bullpen. So he can go to them in the sixth inning and be okay with it. Whereas the Reds need to stretch out a little bit longer. So yeah, got to, got to keep the momentum going. It's a long season. We're only halfway there, but you got to like what you see so far out of the Reds. Reds are on fire, says Bobby. Bobby also saying, we will dissect it. We got lots to talk about on Tuesday. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of really cool stuff happening around baseball. Like I said, the Reds are probably one of the most fun teams to watch right now. Um, so, my grandpa's would be my grandpa's birthday. Uh, that's why we're drinking Miller Lights today. Um, uh, an homage to Mr. Robert Allen Staub. Um, and as always, we are continuing the uh, venture of raising money uh, for the show, uh, but also for a charitable cause. You know, this is this is a fun. It is a fundraising effort. Uh, to bring in funds, you know, it, it helps us pay for this streaming platform. Uh, it's going to help me pay for, uh, you know, better cameras and lighting and, and improving the content that I'm able to bring to you guys uh, as viewers and, and, you know, as Lion to Gain family. But we're also giving back to charity. 50% of every dollar up to our fundraising goal, 100% of every dollar beyond that fundraising goal. Um, so we are raising money for uh, the Wounded Warrior Project. So I challenge you all to, to do it. We're going to do a dollar donation day. That's what today is. That's what I challenge you to do, uh, to donate $1. Uh, 
and uh, the Wounded Warrior Project will will be a beneficiary of that. PayPal and Venmo are in the description of the video. If you haven't already, like the video, share the video, grow the Line to Gain family. We're expanding the outreach. I just uh, started covering the bills, which we'll uh, you know we'll get more into as training camp gets going here. Uh, we're going to be covering the Colts as well. And we're going to be covering, uh, don't let me forget, we're going to be Lions, Colts, Bills, Bengals. I'm forgetting one. How dare I? Lions, Colts, Bills, Bengals. Oh my gosh, I'm spacing out on you guys. It's not the Jets, Corey. Come on. It's not the Dolphins. Titans. Don't let me forget that. <laughs> the most forgettable team in football. The Tennessee Titans. We're going to be talking about them. <laughs> oh, Travis. I'm sorry, buddy. Couldn't believe I forgot the Titans. They're not going to be forgettable this year. Titans are going to be scoring some fucking points, boys and girls. I'm just telling you. All right. So here's basically how it's going to go down tonight. I am going to unveil my bottom 10. Um, I'm going to unveil my bottom 10. We're going to talk about it. Um, we're going to kind of get into why, I, why I've put them there as best I can. Um, we'll have more to say about some of these, some of these characters than others. Uh, from there, we'll bring it up to just before the top 10, and then we'll get into my top 10, okay? So what I want you guys to do, if you haven't already, like I said, drop in the chat uh, for all to see, so we have it documented. Um, I want to see what's your top five, what's your top 10. Give me, give me something uh, that you're comfortable rating. Where is your coach for your team ranked, uh, where would you put him in terms of, you know, maybe top 10 or middle of the pack even. Just generalities are, are totally cool. Um, but without further ado, I say let's let's just jump into it. All right, boys and girls. Make sure I'm sharing. Yep. All right, so you got it. Good deal. Here's my bottom 10, and there's a couple of factors going on going on here. Um, John, you'll be happy to know that I don't think Dan Campbell is the second worst coach in the NFL right now. I think he's the third worst coach in the NFL right now, uh, mostly because I don't know who the fuck Dan Campbell really is. I don't know who Nick Sirianni really is. I definitely don't really know who David Culley really is. Now, you can look up what they have done in the past. You can look up, you know, you know, maybe previous records or how, you know, if they were a specific coordinator, how did their offense or defense respectively do, you know, whatever, you know, part of the game that they were in charge of. Um, how did they perform? Uh, but at the end of the day, being a head coach is a very, very different aspect of the game than being a coordinator, right? Uh, the best example that I can think of off the top of my head is probably Dick LeBeau. Um, I think Wade Phillips is probably another really good example of that. Um, other guys that are just really way better at being coordinators. I can't even throw, I can't even put Matt Patricia out there because Matt Patricia just we're, we're going to move on. Um, so <laughs> the Texans, I think, are really probably vying for that. Now, this is all dependent on Deshaun Watson, obviously. They're probably the worst run organization in football. As Bengals fans, as Lions fans, you really have to feel good that the Texans exist. <laughs> you really, honestly, you, you got to be okay with where you're at based on the fact that the Houston Texans are also an NFL football team. That's how bad they are. Um, I have zero faith that the Texans um, are going to do anything right 
similar to that of the Jets is kind of how I feel. Um, we'll get to Robert Sala in a little bit, but I, I think, you know, David Culley's got his work cut out for him. Uh, and that being said, I, I, um, I wish him the best, you know, there's, there's not very many coaches of color in the NFL. And I think that, um, you know, the more opportunities that we can get, the more, uh, you know, the more exposure that, you know, there's going to be uh, more coaches in the NFL that are of color, the better the league will be for it. Um, so I wish David Culley the best. However, he's got his work fucking cut out for him uh, with the Houston Texans. At the same time, if you're David Culley, how do you turn that job down? It's one of 32 jobs at all. There's only 32 head coaches in the NFL. That's it. There's no other professional no, top level head coaches right in football that's the nfl and there's only 32 jobs so if they come knocking you answer more than not especially if you're david cully um nick sirianni of the, of the eagles this guy um i'm getting some gase vibes here boys and girls i'm i'm getting some adam gase vibes this guy was asked how do you what are some of the interview questions that you have, uh, or how do you gauge, uh, you know, a, um, how do you gauge a, uh, oh, I got little, little girlies crying upstairs. Might have to break here in a little bit, boys and girls. Um, chat's going wild right now. I love it. Um, let me get it. Let me leave this list up for you. Let me leave this list. You guys go off crazy in the chat. I'll come back. Check on the chat. Think about your top 10. And uh, let me handle some business at home. And I'll be right back with you guys. All right, all right. Chat's going wild. Let's see what you guys are talking about real quick. You've had some time to, to view. All right. So from John, his top five are Sean McBay, Kyle Shanahan, Peyton. Oh, Sean Peyton, Andy Reid, Bill Belichick. Good list. Solid list. Um, <laughs> he's PC principal. That's who he is. I, I'm thinking, are you talking about McVeigh? I'm, I'm pretty sure you're referring. To, he is. He looks exactly like PC principal from South Park. That's fucking hilarious, John. <laughs> um, Bobby coming in as a Steelers fan. He's saying Tomlin top 10, maybe even top five. Hmm. Interesting. I think that's a, you know, Mike Tomlin, there's a lot that you could say positive about Mike Tomlin. He's never had a losing season. Um, they counted the Steelers out last year to be really, really bad, and they went 11 0. Now, given they absolutely fell off planet Earth to finish the season, uh, but I mean, you got to give them a little bit of credit for that. I'll talk a little bit about Tomlin later, Bob. Don't you worry. Um,. Let's see. John with a comment. 
I forgot about Tom and Bobby. He should be top five as well. Harbaugh, too. It's close. I give the benefit of the doubt to the young guys, though, I guess. Why is that? Why why the benefit of the doubt to the young guys? First of all, you have two ancient motherfuckers in your top five, John. You have Bill Belichick and Andy Reid, and they're like 100. So... <laughs> Uh, Todd with a comment. I thought Zach Taylor is probably somewhere between 20 and 25. His top five is McVay, Peyton, Reed, Tomlin, and Shanahan. Wow. A lot of love for Mike Tomlin. You guys are going to hate me. Bobby, in no order, just a random top five. Tomlin, Reed, Peyton, Arians. Bruce Arians. Wow. John Gruden. You got Bruce Arians and John Gruden over Bill Belichick. Bobby, your hair is going to light on fire later. (laughs) Let's get back to the list. All right. So let's get get back into this here. Um, So talking about, sorry, we were talking about what does Sirianni do um, to like kind of get a feel of how competitive one of his players or in this case it was like future potential players uh, for the NFL draft, like they get an opportunity to interview or meet with these potential guys that they're thinking about drafting. And one of the things that he does as the head coach of a multi billion dollar organization is this motherfucker plays rock, paper, scissors with them. All right, so let me just put this in perspective for you in a different sense that maybe seems a little bit more tangible. Because oftentimes we lose sight of the fact that this is a multi-billion dollar organization. This is a um, very serious thing, in my opinion, uh, you know, in terms of building a football team. Um, it is a game. Yeah, it's a game. But it's also li- people's livelihood. Uh, they're putting their bodies literally on the line going into this profession. So let me just put this out there in a different way. Let's say you are a recent college graduate and you're one of the top, let's say, 30, you know, incoming to the workforce. And you have the opportunities to interview with, let's say, like Boeing, Procter & Gamble, Apple. um, Let's just think of one one other major corporation, uh, Unilever, right? Those are the four companies that you're going to be interviewing with. And one of these organizations decides, you know, let's say you're going for a sales position and competitiveness is important in sales. Trust me, that's what I do. And let's say that one of these companies decides to gauge your competitiveness by paying rock, paper, scissors with you. I'm probably not really interested in that organization any longer. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Oh, Lord. Dan Campbell at 30. I, you know, I'll be honest with you guys. When he first came out on the scene, like talking about biting kneecaps, and you know, we're gonna get back up and bite your other kneecap, and uh, I kind of felt like he, this guy is like so unqualified for this job. Just, just based that was the vibe I got. I have nothing to base that off of, right? Um, but that was the vibe that I got from this guy. Just. Whoa, he has, he's he's lost already in his first presser. And then he comes out and he does the uh, the race car thing. I thought that was hilarious. I didn't think that was a... If you don't know what I mean, Dan Campbell was like grand marshal for the Belle Isle race here in Detroit, the uh, IndyCar Series race. And he came out in a presser wearing this helmet. Um, an IndyCar helmet, and it was, it was actually pretty funny. Caught a lot of shit for it, but it was actually really funny. The, the thing with with Dan Campbell, a lot of it with Sirianni, uh, even Staley, um, Arthur Smith, Urban Meyer, Robert Sala. The reason that these guys are in the bottom ten is because they're rookie head coaches. Um, you know, I I think Joe Judge could potentially be more of a middle of the road coach by the end of this season. Um, unfortunately for him, a lot of that depends on what Danny Dimes, you know, Daniel Jones, their quarterback, what he's able to do. Um, he's also kind of handcuffed by the fact that his general manager is inept. Um, Gettleman for the Giants is an absolute disgrace. Um, 
So it, there is a little bit to be said for that. Uh, Dan Campbell is is really a question mark. You know, I don't I don't know. I don't really know what he's going to be, what he really is. But at this point, you know, if I had to pick, that's about where I would pick him. You know, I'd probably take these other coaches ahead of him um, just based on feeling. A lot of it is just based on gut. Um, Arthur Smith, I'm really interested to see what they're going to be doing in Atlanta. Um, How similar, if you don't know, Arthur Smith, former coordinator of the team that we are covering, the Tennessee Titans. <laughs> he uh, obviously Titans is one of the best offenses in the league, if not the you know highest scoring offense in the league. Um, so I'm interested to see how much of that offense is able to to translate out into uh, you know Atlanta with Matt Ryan. Uh, obviously now they got Kyle Pitts. Um, Julio is gone, so that's interesting. You know. Uh, switching a coordinator for a wide receiver basically did the Atlanta Falcons and the Titans, uh, but Calvin Ridley as well. So I, I'm really I'm really interested to see where this Atlanta uh, offense goes next year. Urban, um, he's ranked higher than some of the other rookie coaches because of what Urban Meyer brings to the table. Uh, Urban Meyer wins. Um, I'm I think that. You know, a lot of these guys that are now in the NFL know Urban Meyer. Um, you know, since he's been at Florida, since like he was at Florida in like 2004. You know, most of the guys that are in the NFL currently, you know, didn't graduate college till after that, right? So they know what Urban Meyer has done. It's not like Urban Meyer won a national, his like first two national championships last year. And then came straight to the NFL. You know, Urban's been around the college game for a while. Most of these players in the NFL know who Urban Meyer is. They know what he brings to the table. And why do I bring that up is because there's not really going to be any of that kind of... I think it's going to be a pretty smooth transition for him going into this role um, versus going into a very veteran-laden roster that he's going to have some guys that are, you know his age essentially not really obviously urban Myers in his fifties, but like, you know, old, you know, salty vets that have been around the league for a while, like, um, that, that aren't really into buying into his probably new way of coaching comparatively to what they've been used to being in the NFL for that long. Right. So that's why I have urban there. Zach Taylor, um, Zach Taylor has proven to kind of be, at this moment, a bottom 10 coach. Um, No winning seasons. Two road wins. Um, That's pretty much it. Um, The inability to win games, close games. He has a lot of of, uh, single-score losses, does Zach Taylor's Bengals. And... That, to me, shows a couple of things. Your roster isn't ready, but also you you don't necessarily know how to win as a team yet. Uh, And that falls on the head coach. So, um, Zach Taylor, Joe Judge, Arthur Smith, Robert Sala, even Dan Campbell are some guys that I think could move up in this list. You know, if we were to do this list at the end of the year. Um, Zach Taylor, this this has to be a make or break year for him. As a head coach, if you so we got seventeen games now. If they don't win nine games, why? Are, what are we doing? What are we doing as a team? You your your Super Bowl window is open now. This is this is you're on the rookie contract, right? That's that's the window, is the rookie contract window. So you're on you're on uh, Joe Burrow's rookie contract right now. This will be his second year. You got two more, and then the fifth year option for the team to maintain that contract for another year, which they will take probably, right? You know, barring continued injuries or anything like that. But um, it's now. It's time to win, and it's time to add assets and, and build a team. And if Zach Taylor isn't able to do that, you got to cut. You got to cut your losses and move on. There's no. This isn't. This isn't a Marvin Lewis situation where we're talking about a 16-year tenure. 
Um, we need to be competing for championships within the next two years or it's time to go. And if we're not making steps towards that, now I'm not saying the Bengals need to go to the playoffs and they need to, you know, make a, a Super Bowl run this year, but I'm saying you need to start competing for that. Like we need to start seeing, you know, closer. We can't continuously pick on the top 10 anymore. We need to be a competitive football team. If we're not able to do that, it's time to walk away. So is Zach Taylor on the hot seat? Yes, he is. If they lose, you know, ten football games, it's time to it's time for him to go. Um, and the reason Sala is is ranked higher is because I've seen what he's been able to do in terms of, um, you know, managing a defensive unit uh, over the last few years with the Niners. Um, that which they were absolutely devastated last year with injury. Um, to kind of throw that out the window. Um, but Robert Sala looks like a guy that I would literally follow into battle at any moment, <laughs> just based on his energy, um, his demeanor. Looks like a guy that I'm ready to uh, to run with. Now, the Jets, you got to kind of take that with a little bit of you know a grain of salt, if you will, but the Jets are kind of a, a team that, similar to that of the Texans, I don't trust most of the things that they do as an organization. I don't trust their quarterback right now, um, Zach Wilson. So, but we'll see. We'll see. I'm I'm looking forward to get back. Let's see the chat here. I want to get back here and see what's going on. All right. Bobby with a comment, I hate Belichick. Well, yeah, like Bill Belichick's a total douchebag. We we can all agree to that, right? Bill Belichick sucks. That said, he's going to be in the Hall of Fame. Um, probably considered top five. Like we can, everyone can agree, top five all time. I think. I think we would say top five all time. Bill Belichick. Even if you don't agree, history will say that. History, I think, will say that Bill Belichick is going to go down as one of the top five coaches in the NFL of all time. At least in this current, at this current juncture, in, in time and space and relativity. <laughs> John with a comment. I guess because McVeigh and Shanahan have proven a lot at a young age. To me, that's valuable. Yeah, no, I my my point wasn't that. Um, getting back to John's previous comment, he's given the young guys the benefit of the doubt. I think I think uh, make. McVeigh and Shanahan are top five. That's that's a great spot for them, in my opinion. Um, we'll get into exactly where uh, they are a little bit later, but um, yeah, I think that those are those are fair placements. Uh, you know, it looks like most of the chat agrees with you as well. Um, but my my point was more of the fact that you know you gave the young guys the benefit of the doubt, but yet you had two of the oldest coaches. In the NFL, in your top five, in Andy Reid and Bill Belichick, Pete Carroll though, one of the is I think the oldest coach in the NFL, if I'm not mistaken. John with another comment: The Detroit Lions only hire cartoon characters. <laughs> Zach Taylor should be higher. He was president of the United States. It's a fair point, except for did I spell his name right? You spelled his name, John, you spelled his name, Zach Taylor, as in President of the United States. I spelled it Zach Taylor, head coach of the Cincinnati Bengals. Todd with a comment here. Zach Taylor also doesn't manage the locker room well, which hurts on-field performance. Hmm. I think what you are referencing there is like the comments made by William Jackson and probably the comments or rather the scenes that we saw unfold on the sidelines in relation to Carlos Dunlap and Lou Anarumo. Uh, for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, allow me to divulge. So last year, um, I think it was last year. I don't know. This last year has felt so long. Um, yes, it was last season. Uh, there was kind of some question marks around Carlos Dunlap. At first it was like, is he healthy? 
come to find out he was entirely healthy. What we saw there was Carlos Dunlap's role being reduced significantly, pretty much solely um, in different package platforms, whereas Carlos Dunlap, for most of time as a Cincinnati Bengal starting, taking 67% of the snaps on the defensive side of the ball, uh, if not more, um, sack leader, um, playmaker, basically captain of the defense, like the of the at least the defensive line, if not Geno Atkins, it's Carlos Dunlap, right? Uh, well, his role is significantly reduced. Now, Carlos Dunlap still had six sacks last year, most of which were at Seattle, but uh, productive football player. There was no question about his ability to play. He could, he can still play. Now he doesn't start in Seattle, uh, but he still produces and he gets the to the uh, the quarterback quite often. Anyway, um, some things going around on Twitter, social media, you know, talking about well, just fucking trade me, all this, and then one week I can't remember which week it was. It all boils over on the sideline. And Lou Anarumo and Carlos Dunlap are visibly shouting at each other. One report says that Anarumo to Zach Taylor saying, 96 has got to go, is what he said. Um, Literally a week later, Carlos Dunlap was traded to the Seattle Seahawks for a a washing machine, basically. little semi-pro reference there for you. Um... So if that's let me let me scroll down here in the chat. I'm Bobby. I'm gonna get to you. Um, so Todd, if if that's what you're talking about, I guess um, you could look at what Zach Taylor has now um, on his team. He has pretty much gutted that roster. He and Duke Tobin have pretty much gutted the Marvin Lewis, Marvin Lewis roster. There are very few players that were drafted by Marvin Lewis, specifically on the defensive side of the ball, that are still there today. Um, I guess even most some of the offensive line, you could even say, is pretty much completely flipped. This, this roster has almost flipped completely since the Marvin Lewis era, which is kind of wild to think about it because it's, this is what, his third year? It's kind of wild. So... I would argue that they had 100% participation in OTAs. I could say that the locker room is starting to buy in. That there were a few people that weren't going to be included in the future of this team. Now, maybe that's wrong. Maybe that was wrong of Zach Taylor to do that. But he's the head coach. That's his decision to make. At the end of the day, this is a business. Right? Zach Taylor's livelihood depends on how well this team is able to perform. So if he feels like there's somebody on this roster that is either not going to be a part of the future or if they are bringing a negative attitude to practice or to the locker room, and if he needs to decrease their role, get them out, whatever he needs to do, that's his decision. Now, they're not going to like it. Um, But I would say that at least a lot of the time, you know, when you're hearing people talk about Zach Taylor – uh, it's at least a, from the player's side, it, there's a lot of positive things. Now, what are they going to say? What are they going to say? What's Joe Mixon going to say? Zach Taylor's a fucking idiot. <laughs> like, what's he supposed to say? Yeah, they're going to gas their boy up. There's no benefit to them not, unless it's like the writing's on the wall, it's time to go kind of thing. But I think there's a little bit of truth to that, but I, I'm starting to be a believer of the opposite of that, Todd. So I appreciate that perspective, though, because I think I do think there's a lot of people that agree with you on that. Um, one more comment here before we start getting into the uh, um, what would this be? Eleven through twenty-two, the mid eleven. That's what we'll call them. We're doing bottom ten. Is it mid twelve? That'd be middle twelve, and then the top ten. Uh, Bobby's saying he's one of the best coaches of all time, but my list is based on right now and what he did last season. I have concerns putting him in the top five right now. I think that's a fair point. That's a really good point, Bobby. Um, you know, the argument of Brady and Belichick, you know, who, who's the real reason for this success? Who won the Super Bowl last year? Bill Belichick didn't. Homie was watching the playoffs from home. 
getting ready for that draft. Tom Brady added another ring to the pantry. I think that's a fair point. Uh, the Patriots are pretty. I'm I'm pretty down on them again this year. Uh, if you guys watch the record show, uh, but we went out and predicted the record for all 32 teams. Um, I'm not I'm not huge on the Patriots this year. All right, let's see what we got going on. Um, yeah, so if you haven't already, like the video, share the video, follow the page if you don't. It would be huge, huge help. Uh, we are raising money for the show and for Wounded Warrior tonight. Uh, quick check-in on the Venmo. Challenging everybody to donate a dollar. One dollar. One dollar. One dollar donation. One dollar make you holla. Uh, let's see here. And that's where we're sitting right now. We are sitting at 100 and 75 bucks. We're sitting at 175. Our goal is 400. Once we get to 400, we all make that donation to the Wounded Warrior Project. All right, cool. Let's take a gander here. All right, the next one is going to be 11 through 22. Make sure we're sharing. Good deal. All right. 11 through 22. We're starting to get into the meat of it. And Bobby, this might be where your head explodes um, as to where I put some of these guys. <laughs> um, particularly, I'm looking at number 18 there, Bob. Um, one second. So go ahead, take a look at this list, and I'll be right back. I'm interested to see what you guys have to say about this. So let's see. Matt Rule, Panthers, second year head coach. That's pretty much why he's that low. I got a lot of faith in the Panthers this year. Um, I think that they're going to make some moves. I think we're going to see kind of a revived Sam Darnold. I'm not big on Sam Darnold by any stretch of the imagination, so please don't get that twisted. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, him with Rule there um, and with. Joe Brady, offensive coordinator that was at LSU the year of um, you know LSU's national championship with Joe Burrow there. Um, I think there's you know some potential. Uh, I think if CMC can stay healthy, um, I think they got some underrated weapons there as well. I'm looking forward to seeing what uh, the Panthers can do, and, and and Matt Rule could quickly move up this list next year. Zimmer, Zimmer is pretty low on this list, and I'm starting to lose that shine, that shimmer that Zimmer had, if you will. And I, I think I, I don't want to sit here and say that I think Mike Zimmer is just ultimately a better coordinator, um, but he's getting really close to just being Marvin Lewis 2.0. Um, the Vikings were in an NFC championship game. They were. And then look how quickly they fell off. Um, I don't, I, I don't have the, uh, the confidence that Mike Zimmer is the same, like offensive mind or, or excuse me, he's a defensive minded coach. But I, I don't think he's the same kind of schemer as like a Bill Belichick or a Mike Tomlin or I'm trying to think of other defensive, you know, successful coaches. Um, most of what you're getting right now is, is more in the, uh, the offensive schemes. But even when you're looking at like, you know, Andy Reid, is just he runs that offense and it's so creative and unique and 
Zimmer is more of like, this is the way it's done and we're going to do it and we're just going to keep doing it until it works. And if it doesn't work, it means it's because we need different personnel. I just, I don't have that same like forward thinking when it comes to head coach uh, for, for Mike Zimmer. But anyway, uh, Mike McCarthy. Um, yeah, I'm not a real big believer in Mike McCarthy. We don't have to spend a whole lot of time there. Matt Nagy, same, same deal. Um, was supposed to be this kind of like guru coming out of the Canadian Football League, and you know there's really a lot of excitement, and there's some you know initial success with the Bears, but um, the the lack of development that happened with Mitch Trubisky to me is is pretty telling. Uh, so that's why Matt Nagy's there at 19. John Gruden, where do we start with John Gruden? I'm gonna come out and say this tonight on. Uh, July 11th, 2021. I think John Gruden may be one of the most overrated head coaches in the history of football. Um, I don't, I'm not buying what he's selling anymore. Uh, when John Gruden, you know, first came into, you know, doing the, the booth on Monday Night Football is pretty exciting. And, you know, there's a lot of, in his like QB room, you know, his quarterback one camp or whatever, the thing that he did where he would sit down with potential draft prospects at quarterback and go through plays and the Z7 banana Y or whatever the, the play is that he would run through these quarterbacks with. And, uh, you know, that was a lot of fun. Um, but I just, I'm not a believer in in, in John Gruden anymore. I, I, I haven't seen it with the Raiders. Um, so... It'll be interesting to see what happens going forward, but I just I'm, I'm not feeling it anymore. I'm not feeling it. Let's. I want to take. I want to hop back into the chat and see what you guys are saying real quick. Let's see here. John with a comment. I was, I agree with your middle of the pack list. Maybe Zimmer higher. He does well with his talent. He's been in the hunt with mediocre QBs throughout his tenure. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, I was hoping Stefanski would crack your top 10. But I think it's fair after season after one season. If Cleveland makes a strong run, I think he's a top 10 coach. And that, and we'll get to Stefanski here in a minute because I think you're right, Todd. No comments on Gruden, though. That's interesting. Um, rolling along here, Matt Lafleur. I'd say middle of the road. He's got the you know arguably the best quarterback in the football right now, not named Patrick Mahomes. Um, so I I don't understand the, the decision. To take the ball out of your quarterback's hand last year in the NFC Championship game and kick a field goal, I, I I don't know. I don't I don't understand that. I don't I don't understand that mindset. So and that's that. There's only one person responsible for that, and that's Matt Lafleur. Cliff Kingsbury, I'm a little skeptical to go any higher with him here. Um, some some good success that that Arizona team has turned around for sure. Um, you know, it wasn't, you know, but four years ago or even less than that, that they had the number one overall pick and took Josh Rosen a year later, they had the number one overall pick. It took Kyler Murray. Excuse me. Been a long weekend. Sorry about that. And, uh, so I, or excuse me, J- uh, Rosen wasn't the number one overall pick. I misspoke there, but they had a, a top three pick took Rosen. And then they took Kyler Murray number one overall. So, you know, they were a really bad football team for a long time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're competing now. Uh, the NFC West is probably one of the best divisions of football. It is the best division in football, I'll say. Um, and they're competing. They're doing better. So uh, the only knock on Cliff Kingsbury is is the ability to sustain a 16-game season. Now 17-game season, they haven't been able to do it. They kind of start off really, really hot, and then they kind of burn out. Brian Flores, I think he could potentially move into the top 10 next year, um, depending on where the Dolphins go, what is happening at quarterback for the Dolphins. 
that's 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 the biggest thing. Are you are you set at quarterback? And if so, I think that's going to allow that team to progress a little bit further. Vrabel, I like him. I'm really, you know, I I think the ability. I I would one another guy that I would just follow into battle. Right, is Mike Vrabel. I'd, I'd buy whatever he's selling most of the time, and ride or die with him. Uh, but the biggest knock that I would say that I have on Vrabel is that. At least in my head, like I'm thinking he should be a defensive guy because he played defense and all. But his defenses have been so bad, so bad. Like the Titans can't stop a nosebleed with a pack of tissues. Bad. So that's my knock on Vrabel. Um, Stefanski, um, again, could be in the top 10, you know, this time next year. Um uh, the Browns, I think, have most of the pieces there. If, 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 like, so they had, like, let's look at, you know, the facets of the game. You have your head coach, your quarterback, running game, O line, wide receivers, and then kind of ability to defend, right? We'll, we'll generalize defense. The Browns have the head coach, I think, figured out. Running game figured out, offensive line figured out, quarterback figured out. Um, they just the wide receivers are figured out. They just their defense is kind of the only thing that they really need to, f- to figure out, and they've made some steps to address that this year. Um, so, and why why do I get think that they have it figured out with Stefanski is because he's utilizing their their weapons appropriately. He understands what he has in a running game, and he understands how a running game can help your quarterback. He understands that if the defense thinks one, one, let's move back up. Baker Mayfield's very good at throwing on the run. He's very good at it. So if you have a running game to supplement with that, you have the opportunity to do these little play action rollouts, bootlegs, get Baker moving, get everything shifting open up a bigger pocket for Baker as well, give him more time, all of this different views and angles that he can throw the football at. It's a, it's, it's a scary, it's a scary combination when you have that ability. And that's why the Browns, you know, won their first playoff game in a long time last year. Uh, Bruce Arians. I, I, I have to commend him in coming into this organization of the Buccaneers and winning a Super Bowl. Hmm. Yawning on you guys big time tonight. Sorry. But the biggest knock that I got to give Bruce is that um, he's the greatest quarterback of all time. And uh, they literally stacked that roster. Everyone was willing to take, like, Gronk came out of retirement, went to the Bucks. Uh, they already had Godwin. They had Mike Evans as well. <laughs> then they went and got Antonio Brown. Um, and that defense is stacked as well. So, I mean, they, they just had a loaded roster. It's an, it's easy to be a head coach when your roster is that loaded. That That's my only knock. Pete Carroll at 11. Um, good coach. Solid coach. Uh, better than my team's head coach. I just don't really think he's elite um you know russell wilson's you know consistently an mvp candidate um you know if we're going to talk about the packers wasting aaron Rodgers, are we going to talk when when does the conversation start coming about the seahawks wasting russell wilson a generational talent in my opinion that you got in what the third round they drafted russell wilson when does that conversation start happening because the seahawks consistently fail to address needs that would allow them to be an elite football team. They had that little gap where they had the most, you know, crushing defense, the Legion of Boom. But even during that time, their offensive line was shit. Russell Wilson was one of the most sacked quarterbacks in football, running for his life, taking a lot of hits. Now, some of that's the way Russell plays, and I've talked about that on this show. Um, Some of that is on Russell for... You know, that improvisation that he brings to the game. But that's also how you want him to play. Similar to Joe Burrow, you want him to do that. Patrick Mahomes, you want him to do that. Um, So there's a little bit, uh, you know, to be said about that. But, um, 
you know, I, I, I think that if, if Pete Carroll were truly the, an elite head coach, um, you know, they, they had, they have potential to be like a, a Belichick and Brady kind of thing, um, where they were, you know, could go on these runs for, you know, consistently competing for Super Bowls, if not in Super Bowls. So that, that's the only reason Pete Carroll's not in the top 10. So interested to see what you guys have to say. All right. Comment from Todd. I really hoped Kingsbury and Kyler Murray were going to mesh together better with Kingsbury's background. I thought for sure he would get Murray stronger right away. Travis, rank the coaches based on who would win in a fight. You had mentioned this, Travis. Who? All right, so like Mike Vrabel versus Robert Sala, is that the only real thing that matters? Is that the only real ranking that, like, is that, who else would we care if they got into a fight out of those guys, or out of the head coach? Those are the only two I'd want to see. Um. That'd be that. That's a that's a tough call <laughs> as to who's gonna win that one. Probably just Robert Sala because he's bald and bald guys don't give a fuck. What do they have to lose? Nothing. They've already lost it all. <laughs> it's all gone. <laughs> Can't trust a man with nothing to lose. Cool. All right. So, think about it. If there's any more top five, I need another beer. You guys, need, anybody need one? You want me to grab you one? Um, if you haven't already, drop your top five in the chat. Um, if you haven't already, donate a dollar. If you haven't already, like the page, like the video, share the stream tonight, get people in here. We're about to get into the top ten. I'm going to go grab another beer, and then we're jumping into it. Here we go. Now, that, you know, I, I haven't been able to do the show. Like the last, the other night, I was going to do like a makeup show. We weren't going to do it on the fourth of July. We we're going to do it on the fifth, which is a Monday. Life got in the way. wasn't feeling it. wasn't prepared. So we pushed it out. We we're going to do it Wednesday. Wednesday. I don't know if you're friends with me on Snapchat. If you are, you saw this video. But Wednesday. I got caught in a crazy storm. Um, you know, we're going 10 miles an hour on the highway. Everyone's got their hazards on, going real slow in this huge rainstorm. And the hail starts. So I pull under an overpass and I'm sitting under there just videoing this. Like, what? This is crazy. And then all of a sudden, boom! A transfer, our power lines went down, a transformer blew right near my car. Uh, highways were locked down. It took me like three hours to get home. There was absolutely no way in hell I was doing a show that night. So decided to push it out to today. Get back on the Sunday train. Cheers, Grandpa. But yeah, um, so I appreciate the, uh, the patience. Sorry, it's uh, been a little while since we did the show, but here we are. Glad to do it. All right. The top 10 is here, ladies and gentlemen. And I think what we'll do is one at a time. I like that. One at a time. Should we recap? If you're new to the... Yeah, let's recap where we've been. Let me get this... Uh, this dock situated here so I can get a nice clean presentation for oh, that's why for all you lovely people all right 
Recap coming shortly, followed by Top 10. Here we go. All right, here's 11 through 32. Pete Carroll, Bruce Arians, Kevin Stefanski, Mike Vrabel, Brian Flores, Cliff Kingsbury, Matt LaFleur, John the Fraud, Gruden, Matt Nagy, Mike McCarthy, Mike Zimmer, Matt Rule, Robert Sala, Zach Taylor, Urban Meyer, Arthur Smith, Vic Fangio, Joe Judge, Brandon Staley, Dan Campbell, Nick Sirianni, and David Cully out of the Texans. So, there it is. And let me get this uh, presented. Any any comments? No no comments on the uh, on Robert Sala versus Mike Vrabel in a fist fight. No 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 picks there. Come on. All right, number ten. Coming in number ten is Ron Rivera out of the Washington Football Team. Um, Ron Rivera defeated cancer. As of late, there's a there's a there's a little a tip of the cat to him, um, <clears throat> but I think it's pretty amazing as uh, a team that has been so shitty for so long, um, you know, QB purgatory for the longest time uh, since pff, shit RG three his like rookie year. This is the last time they had like a really good quarterback. Um, so coming into that organization and having one of the best defenses in football, the Washington football team, um, gotta, gotta be really proud of what Ron Rivera has been able to do so far there in Washington. And I think they're going to get better. They're going to continue to get better. Uh, he's going to build it similar to that of the Panthers. He's going to build it around that defense. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing what, where he goes with the Washington football team. Any guesses on who nine would be? Any guesses on nine? We'll wait no more. Frank Reich. The Colts. Not a lot to say about it. I think he's a good coach. The Colts are getting better. He's had a lot to deal with. I think it's going to be interesting. Oh, I just gave it away, didn't I? Might as well roll with it. Sean Payton, I got him at eight. Ooh, I'm gonna catch some flack for this. Uh, a lot of you guys, I get, he's not that far off. Give me a fucking break. You guys have him in your top five. I got him in my top eight. All right. Just because he's not number one doesn't mean I think he's a bad coach. He's a great coach. Um, I'm really, really, really interested to see how, you know relevant Jameis Winston is in their team next year. <laughs> if you guys caught the last show where we ranked the 32 starting quarterbacks, you know that we put Jameis Winston at 32. And uh, there's a reason. Oh, no. Come on. Don't do this to me. Here we go. All right. We're just going to creep up one at a time. Number seven, Mike Tomlin of the Pittsburgh Steelers never had a losing season. That's pretty amazing. Like, fuck the Steelers, but Mike Tomlin has never had a losing season. That's amazing. Um, very, very good head coach. Um, my reason he's not in my top five. Let me give you this. The reason he's not in my top five, I think Mike Tomlin, you want to talk about running a locker room poorly, Mike Tomlin cannot command a locker room he has no control over it whatsoever in my opinion that's what it is um how many times have we seen videos on like from players going live in the locker room or just the whole Le'Veon bell antonio brown circus that was going on for a while and juju shit poopster and everything that he's been doing with his tiktok shit that comes at the end of the day. That falls back on on the head coach. I'm just saying. So um, that's why he's not in the top five. Is he a great head coach? Yes. Is he a Hall of Famer? Probably. That's why he's not in the top five. 
Number six. John Harbaugh. Ravens. I mean, do you guys know the story of him? I want to give you a little, uh, little bit of his coaching history. So, John Harbaugh, running backs and outside linebackers coach at Western Michigan. He was a tight ends coach at Pittsburgh. He was a special teams coach and secondary coach at Moorhead State. Then he was at the University of Cincinnati as a special teams coordinator. Indiana as a special teams coordinator. Philly as a special teams coordinator. And defensive backs coach before he was the head coach of the Baltimore Ravens. So this is a head coach with a specialty in literally special teams. <laughs> um, yeah, consistently, the Ravens uh, are a team that has been able to reinvent themselves since John has been the head coach of that team. Um, once has won a Super Bowl, AP NFL Coach of the Year in 2019. Um, pretty amazing how he looks at the game and is able to reinvent what his team does or what it means. Um, so John Harbaugh at six. So now you know the top five candidates. Where are they going to be listed? Let's see here. Jump back and see if anything crazy is happening in here. John with a comment here. Rivera is awesome. I think Ron, Ron Rivera is awesome. What do they call him? The Riverboat Gambler? Isn't that his nickname? What an awesome name. All these coaches are great. I agree, Corey. And they are. Peyton just has an ability to draft and develop monster player monster players. I don't know how he does it. Todd, I found that video and showed so many people. Winston's elite. <laughs> Talking about that Jameis Winston video. How can the personal actions of players be on the coach? I get the juju thing. That should have been squash. But A.B. lost his mind. They cut him. And Le'Veon was just greedy. I don't agree with you. But I respect your opinion. No, that I totally. I, I appreciate the, uh, the ability to disagree. Um, I don't think Le'Veon Bell was greedy. Uh, I think Le'Veon Bell wanted to get out of Pittsburgh. If he was greedy, he would have taken the Pittsburgh deal. Um, Le'Veon Bell simply didn't want to play there anymore um, because the big the deal that Pittsburgh offered Le'Veon Bell was the big the biggest deal. That was the most money was playing for Pittsburgh. He took a pay cut going to New York, um, so I don't think he was greedy. Uh, but um, the Juju thing is. Huge. I think there's also we're gonna we're gonna get into it a little bit here. The twenty fifteen wild card game. If we want to go back. If you don't remember, this is the Pittsburgh Steelers with the Cincinnati Bengals. A little personal. Uh during that game, well one, I think before that, Mike Tomlin had I think tripped a player <laughs> on the field. Not not in the twenty fifteen wild card game, different football game. I think Mike Tomlin walked out out onto the field a little bit, tried to like nudge a player as he was running down the field. What are you doing? Um, the 2015 wild card game, I think it was Joey Porter was a defensive line coach or a linebackers coach for the Steelers. Um, another one of the coaches under Mike Tomlin's staff and Joey Porter, I believe it was, went out onto the field confronting Bengals players, one of which pulled, I think it was Dre Kirkpatrick at the time, pulled Dre Kirkpatrick's hair, and then an incident ensued. Bengals were flagged. Steelers were not. Um, that all comes back onto Mike Tomlin, in my opinion. 
Uh, there have been videos where like, there have been times where, like I said, players are going live on Instagram in the locker room and people are doing shit and it's not cool to do that. That falls on Mike Tomlin. He runs that locker room. It's his locker room. So how can you quote, how can you put individual actions on, of play? That's his job. He is responsible for that team. Yeah, they're all adults, but the things that happen within that locker room as a football team, that's part of the head coach. Those things wouldn't be happening in Bill Belichick's locker room. There's no fucking way. There's no way that stuff like that would happen in Bill Belichick's locker room. It wouldn't. That's the difference. It wouldn't. I mean, it, it, Mike Tomlin is is a very good player coach. He's very good at I think relating to his players, but I think his players take advantage of that. Uh, and and you've seen it over the last couple of years. Um, not again, that's the only knock I have on him. Um, I think he's a little, um, how do I phrase this? I don't like him just as a Bengals fan, right? I don't like Mike Tomlin. Do I respect his ability to coach? Yes, but I don't like him at all. Uh, so it's very difficult for me to, to formulate, uh, like flattering words about him. <laughs> it's very tough. Um, but he's successful. He's, he's, you know, been successful at what he's done, but uh, I think he's kind of an asshole. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Uh, I think he's just kind of a dick. So is Bill Belichick, though. But these guys are on different different levels. They're not even the same people. All right, let's get the five separated here. I think the some of these are going to make... The fact that nobody mentioned my number four coach is crazy to me. All right, number five. Is Sean McVay. Now, he's ranked as like your guy. A lot of you guys put him at number one. Um, that's, that's a little much. He's, they never won a Super Bowl. How can he be your number one coach? He does, he's never won a Super Bowl. He's been to one, sure. But is that all it takes? Just getting to a Super Bowl to be your number one coach? Now, Top five. Yeah, he's a really, really, really good coach. Like I said earlier, none of these guys are bad coaches. If you're in my top 10, you're a good football coach. Hell, if you're in my top 15, you're a good football coach. Um, probably one of the most creative minds in football. Borderline sociopath. If not psychopath, rather. Not sociopath. Psychopath. Borderline like psych- psychologically insane in terms of his ability <laughs> to recall information about the game of football um, and his ability to see the field in ways that other people don't and create plays um, second to none. Second to one, I would say. There's only one other. No. Second to three. <laughs> uh, there, there's, there's a few other coaches I think are better at that. Um but I, I mean, Sean McVay. I mean, came onto the scene, instant success. Great, great, great football coach. But hasn't won a Super Bowl yet. That's it. That's the only knock. Am I crazy? Am I crazy for putting him at five? Um, John with a comment back on the Steeler the Mike Tomlin locker room thing uh, I agree with you Corey but I think it's fair to say he was somehow able to whisper Antonio Brown for years as a Steeler gotta give him some credit number four has gotta be McDermott then that's from John number four has gotta be McDermott is that what you're saying John John is that what you're saying right now that number four has gotta be McDermott well what do you fucking know McDermott, Sean McDermott, the Buffalo Bills. I I can't say enough about this guy. I mean, 
the turnaround is entirely on him. It's not like these guys are going out and make they, yeah, they went out and got they went out and got digs. Um but if I told you five years ago that the Buffalo Bills would be Super Bowl contenders, you would look at me like I was fucking insane. Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? The Buffalo Bills are top three in odds to win the Super Bowl next year. The Buffalo Bills. Our Buffalo Bills. Line to gains Buffalo Bills, baby, are one of the favorites to win the Super Bowl next year. Wild. Absolutely wild. And I already kind of show, showed him, so I'll put him out right here. Number three, Kyle Shanahan. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the, the, I think the second best offensive mind, the best young offensive mind in the game of football right now is Kyle Shanahan. Um, I don't want to hear anything about last season because the 49ers were absolutely decimated with injury. Um, they will be back in a Super Bowl very quickly. Um, and, and they're going to be fun to watch, uh, watch out for Debo next year. Uh, just watch out for the 49ers offense the next coming years. It's going to be exciting, especially with Trey Lance. You give him a year. Um, wow. Is, I mean, they're just going to light it up. They already got Kittle. Um, who's their use check? How use check is their, uh, they're like H back. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. So that brings me to number two and one. If I give away two, it's going to give away one. So I'll just do both anyway. I got Bill Belichick at two. Andy Reid with the Chiefs at one. So Andy Reid, um, I mean, this guy's been in Super Bowls. Bill Belichick, too, since before I could drive a car. Um you know, what he was able to do with the Eagles for so long uh, and then coming back and doing it with the Chiefs for such, I mean, they're the most dominant, their most dominant team in football on paper every year. What makes McDermott a top five coach? Um, I think it's honestly just the, the ability to turn that team around, um, where they were at before he got there and where they're at now after he's been there. That's as simple as I can make it really. Um, before McDermott was there, they didn't really, they didn't really have a direction. Now that at now after he's there, they're Super Bowl contenders. That's why he's in my top five. They were, they're winning now and they're a very, very good football team. Um, they have the quarterback situation solved. Uh, they've got weapons on offense. Their defense, I'd say they need to improve a little bit on the pass rush. Uh, but the Bills are just a solid football team now, and it's built around his vision. So that's why I would put him in the top five. It's the it's the turn. I'm interested to see what his record as a head coach is. He's 40 and 29 as a head coach. All time. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, yeah, regular season, he's 38 and 26. Let's see, when did he start at the Bills? Just so you get a frame of reference, I think that's a good... Fair question. So 2017. Bills record. Okay. We'll just go since 2000. Why not? All right. All right. Here we go. So 2017. In 2016, rather. Let's, let's back it up. In 2010. The Bills were four and twelve. Then they went six and ten for three straight years. Then they went nine and seven. They went eight and eight. Then they went seven and nine. McDermott comes onto the scene in twenty seventeen 
as the head coach of the Buffalo Bills. They go 9-7, and seven, and for the first time in 18 years, the Buffalo Bills went to the playoffs. Next year, they went 6-10. and 10. Nothing to write home about. Pretty poor. Following year, 10-6. and six. They lost in the wild card again. Year after that, in 2020, 13-3. They lost three football games. And they went to the AFC championship game. Only to lose to the Chiefs. That's a pretty that's a pretty substantial turnaround in my opinion. You're in the conference championship your fourth year. That's that's pretty amazing. Rex Ryan was a better Bills coach. Everyone knows that. Yeah. Everyone knows. While we're here, Rex Ryan was there for one and a half seasons, maybe. First year of Rex Ryan, eight and eight. Next year, seven and nine. <laughs> Losing record as a Bills coach. Everyone knows that Rex Ryan is the best Bills coach. So that's that's why McDermott, Todd. I four years and he's they're in the conference championship game. So one game away from the Super Bowl. If if I told you Zach Taylor was gonna have the Bengals in the conference championship game in four years, where would you put him? Because I would say the Bills and Bengals are kind of in a similar situation before their new head coaches got there. So if that was the performance that you got out of the, your head coach, I mean, that's pretty that's pretty pretty amazing. And then Reed and Belichick are, are my one and two. Um, Andy Reed, been doing it forever. Bill Belichick, been doing it forever. The reason Andy Reed is above Bill Belichick is just because of, as of late, uh, Bill Belichick's teams, you know, they didn't perform last year. Um, so we'll see where, where that goes next year. I'm interested. Um It'll it'll uh it'll be interesting to see what he's able to do with Mac Jones. Um it'll be interesting to see what um role Cam Newton plays, the Patriots. And where they go from here as an organization. So I don't want to spend too much time talking about the fucking Patriots, so fuck those guys. <laughs> but anyway, uh mini camps or or training camps right around the corner. Football is like, what are we, like nine weeks away? September 12th, I think, is the opening weekend of football. It's opening Sunday. Hey, Siri, how many days until September 12th? It's 63 days until then. 63 days until the Bengals and Vikings play at Paul Brown Stadium. I'll be there. I hope you are too, or wherever your team is. Uh cheering them on opening week 63 days until we're all back together uh, so looking forward to that we got a lot coming up i'm looking forward to uh getting together with you guys during the season every sunday night as we're watching sunday night football together uh kind of recapping the week and uh, maybe talking a little fantasy and uh, covering the game as it's happening so i uh, appreciate you guys joining me tonight uh, if there are any other topics john appreciate this topic for this week uh, you drop in the uh, the comment there, wanting me to rank the uh, the head coaches. If there's anything else that you guys want, you know, this show to to talk about, please, this is your show. Let me know. I'll, I'd be happy to do it. Uh, so continue to can you know help me create this content. Invite your friends. Like the video. Share the video if you already haven't. I appreciate. Love you guys. Have a good night. I kick ass this week.